Alright guys, um, my hopes are not high right now, but I just can't help but to say, when you convert your vehicle, or heck, even for robotics, when you do anything with electronics and you require batteries, that's a huge expense. And I'm going to be doing a lot. Not to mention if I ever get into making my house solar, batteries, expensive, like it's one of the biggest expenses, even beyond the solar panels, is those darn batteries. Now, I mean, if you consider all the robots I want to build, the electric vehicle, um, solar, complete solar systems for the house, all my projects, we might be looking at twenty or thirty thousand dollars worth of batteries. Well, to me, it just sounds like. If it is possible for me to get them for free by making them myself, I have got to find out if that's possible. Because that, that would be worth it to me. And for me to teach people how to make their own lithium batteries and do a video series on it, that'd get millions of views. And people would really love me for it. Like, like nobody wants to buy that stuff. Or let's say, you know, this first generation of electrical vehicle people, their batteries start getting low. I could see people wanting to make their own lithium batteries, so I've got to find out about this. I've got to do it. But I don't I think they'll keep it a secret. Like It's got to be patented or something. Alright, let me just start out with Wikipedia. They, they tend to do a decent job. Um, that'd be a good place to start, because I have a feeling the minute I get into YouTube videos, I'm going to hit a dead end. I'll still try it after a while, but I'm going to start off with something I, I know it will be a, a small victory, which is Wikipedia will explain at least the chemistry, but I doubt they'll show anything about how it's made. And then we might be able to get into maybe videos made by factories showing the process, and then that could really open up some doors. Um, but as far as, like, am I going to see some YouTuber like, this is how I made my own lithium battery, like, w with everything else you can YouTube, like, this is how I changed my brakes. I don't think that's going to happen. Although, I'll be the first to make a video like, this is how to make your own lithium battery, and that's really what I want to be able to do, be that guy that just makes it look easy and just shows everything. Yeah, I, I mean, I need to start working again, but I'm just obsessed with getting some of this research done since I've, I've already completed so much of it. And this is kind of like my last major question that I still want to know before I get back to work. Like, you know, the normal grind of just getting things done, not researching. Okay. Uh, they're high cost per unit. See, I don't like that at all. And that's why I'm determined to make my own. Now, as an aside, let's say they're so expensive because of just the materials involved, the lithium itself. Well, I saw how they get lithium. It's for free. They got mountains of it in certain countries out in the desert. Now, this might sound crazy, but because I could be looking at, you know, I'd like to produce maybe $100,000 worth of lithium batteries over the years. Um, I think it's worth a drive. I'm not kidding you. I think it's worth driving I'm not joking at all to South America. I will drive to South America with a trailer hitched to my car. And I will drive back home to China I guess I'll drive up a ramp onto a ship and they'll ship me back across in my car um, with the trailer full of lithium and I believe that would be enough lithium to make you know hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of lithium battery cells and then from there, it's just a matter of smelting it and, you know, just making a forge and melting it down and creating all the little shapes. And, and then I imagine there's some kind of acids involved in, 
you'll have to buy the acid ingredients and mix it all up. So it's going to involve some chemistry and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's going to involve some, a uh, little bit of blacksmithing. But, and maybe some welding. And then, boom. I mean, we can totally do this, guys. Uh, you know what? I, I could, before I cross the border, rather than just load up a bunch of powder and it looks suspicious, I could smelt it or whatever right, right there in the desert. Bring my forge materials with me or whatever. Or buy the, the materials to make the forge in that country. Which isn't suspicious if I buy it from different stores and whatever. And then, uh, you know, rent out a little hut. Forge it all down. Make little, uh, bars of it. Little metal bars. I don't think anybody would care about a, a metal bar. Or better yet, make it into big metal sheets. Sheet metal stacked up in the back of a car doesn't seem suspicious at all. It's just sheets of metal. It's like, oh, are you a welder? It's pretty innocent. But that's pretty much what I'll have to do to get my free lithium. And I mean free! Because it's there for the taking. It's just sitting out in the desert. Now, I don't know if the deserts that contain the lithium were already purchased by, you know, Tesla and other big battery companies, and, and you can't even go into those types of deserts. They're already private property. I don't know. Or are they just national deserts, and these big companies pay a permit to, like, the government to move in and, and harvest the lithium? I'm not sure how that works. It might all be private land at this point. Uh, so that would suck if we were blocked as you know, normal people from getting lithium. But it'd be worth it to me. I think it'd be fun. I mean, if that's what it takes. You know what? Let's get off batteries then and get down to lithium. Because <coughs> yeah, if, if there are lithium in disposable products. I just saw lithium disposable batteries. We could maybe somehow tap into garbage lithium, whether it's dumpster diving, scrapyards, whatever, finding out what has lithium in it, and then getting that for free or for dirt cheap as scrap. Recycling, in other words, might be a better route if it becomes impractical to get free lithium from mining. Anytime I don't understand a word, I have to middle mouse click and read it. Hi, baby! Baby, they hear you. What's up, Daniel? Uh, the car conversion to a hybrid project is now complete as far as the planning and design phase. And it's not next up on my to-do list. It was only an early stage research and design thing that I just couldn't resist diving into because of some things I learned about and just paying a lot in gas lately just inspired me. Um, it is a project for the future, but it's not something I'm going to be working on anytime soon. It is pretty low buried on my to-do list, so... It's not like it's going to take over the robot or something. It's, it's not till after a lot of other stuff had been done. Today, I'm researching how to make my own lithium batteries. DIY. And in order to do that, I'm learning about lithium right now. No, I really don't think there's a tutorial on YouTube, which is why I have to dig deep and get into Wikipedia and maybe getting into looking at factory footage 
and hopefully with a lot of other scientific sources, maybe even patents that were created, I can piece together how they're made. I think it's kept very secretive, and I think that DIYers have never even attempted it. There wouldn't be any DIY YouTube videos about it, I don't think. I, I would be the first if I made one. It should get me millions of views. I'm sure a lot of people would love to save money for their solar houses and solar cars and all this stuff by just making their own batteries if it's possible. I'm sure a lot of people have thought of it, but given up. Uh, yeah, I guess I could send a robot there. In fact, uh... I could send drones to carry a robot there and then assemble the robot once they arrive, carry the parts. This way, they could then fly the robot back out of the country through border c patrol, and they could um, harvest the lithium. Heck, the, I wouldn't even need a, a robot, actually, like a humanoid. I could just have the drones have scoops and just scoop up chunks of lithium and fly it all the way back to China for me. They could just be solar-powered drones and land when they need to and just take their time and fly all the way across the world until they get back to me with the scoop of lithium from the desert. <laughs> I don't see I don't I don't think I'll need the green bucket army to be sent by the drones to do it. I feel like the drones could just scoop it up if it like from my understanding of a documentary, the lithium's just sitting on the top of the desert. No joke. But, uh, yeah, if it turns out that it, you have to dig a little more, maybe I should send mobs of green buckets, one-armed bucket bots, by a drone. Wow, I can't believe we drink electrolytes to make our bodies conduct electricity better, because we are actually like robots. Our brains send everything through electricity. Our brains are electrical. That's so weird to think of a human as like a robot. We're electrical beings. That's so odd. You never think of your body as being electrical because it's flesh. It's not like metal. Hey, I'm not a mad scientist. I'm a roboticist. They're not mad. <laughs> Look at that thing, man! That might be my batteries, boys, for my electric car. We're going old school medieval on these fools. I ain't paying for no deck on $4,000 battery pack. We're making this bad boy. Oh, it's going on the list. You can believe that. I'm never going to buy a battery. I'm making batteries. Only a sucker would buy one. Oh, these are just wired in series. That's all they're showing here. <coughs> they didn't even know what wired in series meant at that time. Oh, if you mouse over a word now, they give you a short definition. That's amazing. I think Volta is a really cool name for someone. I'm going to name my son Volta. Although that does sound like kind of like a girl's name, Volta. If I have a daughter, her name will be Volta as well. Crap! I was muted that whole time. I just said... Normally when people learn chemistry, they, uh... have no practical use for it, but I need it to make batteries. And then I said... Uh, batteries are going to become in huge demand as everyone switches to electric cars and electric solar powered houses so lithium will become the most valuable substance on earth due to the huge demand for batteries so I need to start sending my drones out to gather lithium if I have a mountain of lithium I'll be the richest man on earth and I said that I, I'm thinking of uh, making and selling batteries now after I make enough for myself I could have my robots make batteries that'd be an excellent product to sell because I feel like Batteries are just going to be flying off the shelves. 
Well, that's sixty dollars just for a tiny battery, and that's a crap NIM battery. If you want a lithium battery, they're a lot more expensive, actually. And they last much longer, a thousand cycles. They also discharge a lot faster and have a higher energy density and lighter weight for the same energy. So they're just light years better, but they're expensive. And that's why I want to make my own lithium batteries using either recycled lithium or lithium pulled from products that use lithium, if I can find out, or mining my own lithium, or buying lithium in bulk. Making a battery isn't electrical engineering. Making a battery is just a matter of taking a piece of lithium, smelting it or mining it, or melting it down into a pure lithium plate of some shape, and then probably putting it in a container with acid, and now you have a battery. I mean, it's really simple, I'm pretty sure, but I'm still not there yet. I'm still in the process of understanding uh, how the chemical reaction works and how the voltage is created out of all this. I started in late 2015. Uh, I'll be able to make my own motors as well. Like, I'm learning how to make everything. Making the motors, making the batteries. Like, I'm going pretty deep rather than just buying off the shelf stuff because you can save money if you really get deep into technology. My goals? Well, I pretty much just, I want to build like all kinds of really cool stuff. Um, from drones to robots to robotic sharks and robotic animals and then have all these creations make life easier so like they can go gather food and grow crops and all kinds of stuff like that um, so that Basically, you can spend all your time just having fun. You don't have to work. Machines will do all the work. So this is one of those moments where I'm not actually working for money. I'm, I'm reading. I'm learning. I don't get to do this that often. Most of my time I spend manufacturing products to sell online or listing stuff that's old that I don't need anymore online to sell or making YouTube videos and editing that footage and stuff so I can make money on YouTube through ads that play on my videos, that type of thing. So anyways, let me get back to reading, sorry. Can't talk anymore. This time is precious to learn. There are a lot of new lithium mines in Australia. Thanks for telling me that. Because I'm thinking of doing lithium mining to make my own lithium batteries. I'm going to need lithium. Unless if I choose another metal such as sodium, magnesium, iron, zinc, or aluminum, but from what I've seen, lithium is the best, so probably going to want the best. Yeah, I was thinking of taking a truck to South America and filling it up with piles of lithium from the deserts there. It basically just sits on the top of the desert. Or sending drones to fly scoops of lithium from the deserts of South America to my home, where I will then... melt it down into pure lithium for battery production. I'm starting to really understand this chemistry stuff. It's not that hard. Yeah, pretty much. I'll be, uh... dealing with acid that can dissolve a body right on my lap. And you guys will get to watch. It's going to be like Breaking Bad in here. Tesla uses thousands of 18650 cells. And that's thus hence the reason why I want to have the ability to get thousands of 18650 cells for free by making them myself. I have some A123 size cells here. I like that size. But I think, I think this is 18650 right here. I think. The kind that's in a laptop battery pack. But you know, I can make way bigger cells if I want. You don't have to make a cell that small. Might be smart to make 
honey bottle sized shells like this. Cells like this. They, they'll probably have a lot more capacity um, rather than just do a bunch of 18650 in parallel. I think they make them that small because that way you can mass manufacture them and then they fit in small electronic devices so they're more versatile being big. Being that small, they'll fit in more stuff. So factories prefer just to have a single size that one size fits all type of thing. But if you know what you're going to be doing with it, I don't see why you don't just make each cell big. 18 millimeters in diameter? Those are 18 mil. Oh, maybe not. I don't know then. Well, I got all kinds of batteries here that are not 18650. Well, I don't think it matters. That's just a size, like a standardized size. That's all that means. Taking apart Tesla batteries? No, I haven't seen it. Does he actually open the battery or just take apart the battery pack separating the cells out? Yeah, that's not impressive to pull out the cells. I've taken apart battery packs and pulled out the cells. That doesn't help me. I think if you take apart the battery in oil, it wouldn't flare up. I think the flaring up would be oxygen adhering to the lithium at a very high speed. So if you open up the battery like in oil or something like that, clear oil, you can see the opening it up and whatever and work with it without oxygen zooming at it, causing heat and stuff like a fire. Because I need to be able to use lithium, use electrolysis to separate lithium from lithium salt, all that stuff. And also extract lithium from dead batteries and use it for other new batteries so I need to be able to expose lithium open these batteries today I'll be dissecting a Tesla cell to find out what's inside before I do this I want to emphasize that this cell has been fully discharged to zero volts as a result the battery has no charge and it's completely safe to dissect now first I had to find a way to get into the battery without damaging the lithium Cutting into the positive terminal gap made the most sense since it's supposed to be the thinnest part of the battery, and the anode and cathode do not extend above this gap. Now the first thing we can see is the lithium wrap and retainer. If you look closely, you can actually see carbon fiber composite mix in the retainer. This helps reduce the weight of the battery by a tiny amount, which helps improve the energy density ratio. And the positive terminal itself has three small vent holes, which helps release pressure due to a change in altitude or cell failure. Here we can see the O-ring, which allows the cell to remain hermetically sealed so that water cannot get inside. The black dust you see falling off here as I unwrap this roll is the electrolyte. Now this tightly rolled up part of the cell is called the jelly roll. Since the inside of the battery is dry, nearly all of the material, uh, with the exception of the electrolyte, above this gap. Now the first thing we can see is the lithium wrap and retainer. If you look closely, you can actually fully discharge to zero volts. As a result, the battery has no charge and it's completely safe to dissect. Now first, I had to find a way to get into the battery without damaging the lithium. Cutting in the positive terminal gap made the most sense since this was the thinnest part of the battery and the anode and cathode did not extend above this gap. Now the first thing we can see is the lithium wrap and retainer. If you look closely you can actually see carbon fiber composite mix in the retainer. This helps reduce the weight of the battery by a tiny amount, which helps improve the energy density ratio. And the positive terminal itself has three small vent holes which helps release pressure due to a change in altitude or cell failure. Here we can see the O-ring, which allows the cell to remain hermetically sealed so that water cannot get inside. The black dust you see falling off here as I 
unwrap this roll is the electrolyte. Now this tightly rolled up part of the cell is called the jelly roll. This is the inside of the bag. And I'm not calling for investors. I don't want investors. Um, I'm looking to build a lot of small micro businesses that make very small profits and then scale that up little by little using robotics and automation and software. Anodes cannot be negative. Alright, this guy has some sensational titles. I'm going to have to watch most of these if this is for real. The Galvanic Cell. The anode is still zinc that donates its electron. Zinc or lithium, whatever. Uh, I would prefer lithium iron phosphate batteries for my car, um, but lithium ion probably has a better wiki article. Oh! Notice how <coughs> over here you see a shiny gray, over here you see copper. Can I assume that the middle is white? The gray copper bottom is coming off. The flow of current, current is a flow of positive charge. So the flow of positive charge is in the opposite direction of the flow of electrons. That bottom layer limits the flow of positive or limits the flow of electrons from the middle layer to the upper layer. So that bottom layer, the white stuff, is the semi-permeable membrane. It's your salt bridge. The entire system, instead of being s soaked in an acid solution, is dry. It's all based on being very thin and pr tightly compacted and that enables the flowing as if it were in a solution of ions right through all these because they're all so tightly touching <sighs> but I have no idea how am I explaining it all
the real magic here, as the guys in the video says, is that center layer. That center layer is the anode, it is the part that contains the lithium, but it also contains a whole bunch of other stuff. This is a Tesla battery, so it's a lithium ion battery. And it is made one of these two. It's either lithium ion manganese oxide or lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide. I believe it's the second one actually. With the large amount of manganese. Yeah, that's what. Okay, blah blah blah, cobalt aluminum. What? <laughs> My gosh. Why they have to make the lithium based one be the cathode? Because the anode's supposed to be what donates or gives away the electrons and the current flows toward it. See, anode is where oxidation takes place. That means giving away electrodes. That's the positive. Oh, positive. No, that's the negative. Okay, so here's the first curve. Now, what I've done here, obviously. What is interesting, mailbox, is. I don't think he's a fraud. You told me he was a fraud. I researched. I couldn't find anything about him being a fraud. This is real, I think. I believe it. And so I, I'm i probably going to find some videos where I can actually get instructions to follow to make a battery. I think. He's taken the and treating the battery and multiplied them together and popped them uh, once again. So seconds. And you can see that the middle of the front and 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 the front Yeah, watching it at two times speeds because I don't really have time to watch it at one time speed. But it's quite difficult to hold up and certainly can't be holding in small amounts. Um, so we've broken them up and put some nice materials in there to do the experimentation with, but it has made it slightly expensive, and so we can't include everything in there. It's just not possible. There are going to be some other things you do need to get, some of the essential and some of the desirable. Now, you're going to need to be able to um, put it on some kind of charging device. You need some kind of measurement device, and you need some kind of load. Now, obviously, I've got here a rival DPA32A, which is a breakdown of the charger. That has a VK precision of 500, which is a precision load, and then I've got the Rival BM305H, which is a uh, multimeter, 
and these are all nice bits of fish you can kick and very expensive. I'm not going to go out and buy those. If you break those down, what we uh, motivate those is just record the information for us so that we can see how the device is actually performing when we've made it. Don't we just spend that out and many, there are plenty of things available. This is a rather cheap and simple digital multimeter, and I got it from the local electronics store. I think it cost me about 10 pounds, so it's, it's really quite cheap. You need two, one turns the bolt, one turns the amp, and remember it's both in parallel amps and series, and you connect it up. And you just turn it on and you can make uh, readings out of that. So that's a quite a useful little thing that's not very expensive. It does become a little tedious, obviously, because you're uh, then watching the thing all the time, and, and that can be quite tedious. It's much nicer to log it. This is a data logging multimeter from Sealy. It's a TA203, I think it has about 100 pounds, and it has a USB port that will output um, to your computer, plenty of the software, and you can get a nice graph using the um, Sealy TA203. Um, we use that quite a lot, actually. It's quite a nice piece of kit. It's inexpensive, and there's a nice job for logging the data that you don't have to sit and watch that forever. So that's a nice bit of kit. So if you're looking at measurements, and you're looking at those kind of things, obviously you want to go overboard, you can get a level. Um, so really good ways of um, measuring and the data from your back experimentation. You're going to need to do that because you're going to need to do comparison. The next thing you need is some way of charging it. Now, charging it uh, needn't be that expensive. This is a bench top regulated power supply, 0 to 30 volts, 0.5 amps DC. It's a nice little analog thing. I think that is about 50 pounds. Uh, it's got a transformer and then you can feel the weight of it. So it doesn't need to be expensive to set a desktop charging unit. The only thing that can be expensive, actually, is the load. Obviously, this is a precision load, so I just charge it through this. There are many kinds of loads that you can use. You can just put a stroke over resistor on it, and if you know the resistance, then you can work out the power. So you put a just a resistor on as a load, which can be really cheap. Uh, that can be a little tedious, because you just get a resistor. But um, you can also use things like strip LEDs, which we use quite a lot. The other thing we use quite a lot, because it's kind of fun to see it, and, and it gives you some kind of movement, is a little motor. Now, I get these motors um, from those quad copters they sell in the pound stores. You can buy cheap quad copters for about four or five pounds, and you'll be able to pull out four of these little motors. And they're quite useful, so I put the four motors out, and then mount it on a little bit of plastic so you don't have to hold it and that gives a nice way of being a visual representation of um, the discharge that's an unregulated discharge as are um, the leds incidentally it's unregulated but it's really nice to see it and we've got a, a specific capacitor here so this is a capacitor i'm charging here it's on charge at the moment if i just turn that charge off now i can connect that up and it'll give you a nice little there you go and that'll move around to that's at the edges actually now, it's actually quite impressive because this super capacitor is um, basically uh, i think it's two centimeters by four centimeters and it will power that little motor for quite a long time so it's quite nice to be able to do that then when you're doing that, you've got an estimation of how long it uses, and just grab yourself a stopwatch because you'll be able to, um, to stop and start that to give you an idea of how much time that motor will run if you don't have the other measuring equipment. You can still get an idea of how much power is being put through that motor. So it's some way of uh, applying a charge, recording the data, applying a load to your, de uh, your devices, or something that's going to be essential to you. Now the other thing that's probably essential and quite humble is this thing. You can't just pour the stuff into the cup and give them a screw and hope it's going to work. It's not. It's all about intimacy contact. Uh, thoroughness of dispersion. And it won't be possible to get a reasonable, you know, do a reasonable job of that and be able to ground the materials up so you can make an info paint out of them. And the guy who's been for paint making, got to the paint making book, so have a look at that. Now, the other thing uh, we find we need really is somewhere to hold these things together. Now, very often I do this, I just slap them on the bench and then I'll just leave them there. But I work in a lab and I've got a glass top and it doesn't matter if I spill things on the floor, quite often it doesn't matter. So you need some kind of way of putting your back together in a, in a unit that will spill things absolutely everywhere. And the three choices I have on that one is I have a CI-2032 machine, which makes it into cells. That works for a thousand pounds, so it's a bit expensive. And the other is to use these things. These things are uh, quite a part size laminating wallets and they go through a little home laminator like that and they make these really nice cells like that. That one's actually a rechargeable zinc manganese dioxide battery. Uh, this one here is in fact a smaller version of this super capacitor that we've got there. So it's a nice little cell that you can experiment with time and time again. Put lots of things like vegetation and oxidizing and all that sort of change of color of electrolytes um, with the of floating up. All that kind of thing. It's a nice construction way of looking at the cell that you make and it's a nice robust cell and it'll last for ages. The other way is uh, to get yourself a bit of cat on tape and forgive me for a moment. I forgot to get that together. <laughs> we have a bit of cat on tape there on a tape dispenser and I can just pull up a nice cat on tape. And then I can take my battery and I can wrap the tape around the battery to make an encapsulated cell. This one is one of the, uh, this is actually zinc vanadium, this one. So this is a zinc vanadium battery where I've laid it on top of each other, wrapped it in the on, left an opening there, and I can put the electrolyte in there to make that cell. So there's lots of different ways that you can actually encapsulate, there's lots of different ways that you can record your data and provide a load. Uh, you'll need to acquire those things yourself, and you've probably got someone you will get them quite quickly when you begin your battery experimentation. As I say, it's not possible for those two to be here because um, it would just be hundreds upon hundreds of pounds. So those things you're going to need to acquire yourself. Oh, incidentally, that super capacitor is still running. There you go. So the kit is an experimenter's kit. You're meant to experiment. You're meant to explore. It contains a super capacitor kit, but on top of it, it's got a whole load of metal oxide and some metals. Because what we're looking at is that progression from super capacitor to hybrid device to battery. So you can explore those kind of things. And we're going to go through that in a little example later on. Uh, if you want to know how to handle the carbons and what carbons are in there, watch the super capacitor video. It's got some kitchen in there, it's got some graphene in there, it's got some activated carbon and building fiber in there, and it's got some five micron graphite, four different carbons. So you can make different super capacitors. We're going to use some of those carbons in the um, inks that we make in order to make the uh, metal oxide layers that we're going to be using. And so we'll use some of that material there. Now, so the exciting things, as I say, are the oxides, believe it or not. Now, they are chemicals, so you need to treat them with appropriate PPE. In this case, a pair of gloves is fine, because most of these things are actually used as um, pottery glazes, which is the metal oxide and the metal oxide are in fact pottery glazes. Um, these, there is some uh, 
the simplex oxide in there, that's actually used to make your uh, sunscreen lotion, which is on sunscreen. That's pretty harmless stuff. And there's some manganese dioxide in there, which is what you find in your normal double-air battery. So there's some really good oxides in there to be playing around with. We're going to play around with this orange powder, which is the vanadium pentoxide, and we're needing to make a vanadium pentoxide in battery. That's what we're going to end up making. So we're going to play around that with that a little bit. As I said, this is a basis of exploration. You need to be looking at this kind of thing. Make sure you do read that ink-making book. For example, if I take the um, nickel oxide, and I dissolve that nickel oxide in some uh, hydrochloric acid, which is uh, pretty clean, a acid, but you form nickel chloride. Uh, if I then add a little bit of sodium hydroxide to that, it will precipitate times as nickel hydroxide. We think for that, and then if to that I add some ordinary household bleach, what I get is nickel oxyhydroxide. Nickel oxyhydroxide is the active component to any uh, nickel ion battery. So when you look at these materials, have a read around them to see what other playing around you can do with them in order to make them different from what you've been given. Because what you've been given is a basic step. There are other things you can do to it. So for example, this uh, yellow orange powder, it's vanadium pentoxide. If I add another salt to that and heat that up, it'll go... But it's a reddish colour, and that's a pillar of so vanadium oxide. So you need to have a look at those, do a search on pillar of vanadium oxide, have a look at the make them, and then you can change that into a pillar of vanadium oxide. So there's lots and lots of things you can do with these materials. There are lots of ways you can mine them to start experimenting with them. Now, let's make um, a simple oxide ink so that we can use that to um, make some of our devices later on. is an essential little kit is a balance. Now obviously you can add a little balance such as this uh, LPNA 114, not quite expensive, but another really useful thing are these things which are just dual balances. So this is a dual balance brought up eBay, in the back and down. It measures um, down to a few grams or so, which is kind of useful, a few points per gram, which is uh, hundreds of a gram, which is kind of useful. So you set the whole thing up, tar it, so you've got some weight, and we're going to make that uh, and we're going to that we're going to use in our device. Now we really don't use much of this stuff. We're giving you a little bit, but there's a lot there, because we use points per gram really. So I'm going to put in one gram, of magnesium salt. So here's my one gram magnesium conductor, I'll pop that away. Now in order to make this conductive, because this will be non-conductive, I need to have a conductive added additive, and we need to reach something called the percolation threshold. That is the amount of additive we add in order to make it conductive. Less than that, it's not going to conduct at all. More than that, it's a bit worse. It's obvious why, because when you add the particles, if they're in touch, there's a conductive pathway, so we get a threshold at which all the particles can, can touch, and they form a conductive pathway, and that's what we actually need. Now usually, a good down to this is somewhere between 10 and 20% by weight the conductive additive to your metal oxide. So we've got one gram of here, that's over 20% in, we need 0.2 of a gram of our fine mark graphite, which is what I'm just adding now. There we go. So a tiny, tiny amount is actually what's needed. And we've got this amount, which is going to make our metal oxide additive onto our electrode. So we can pop that away. Now again, with things like um, the amount of binder you put in, you need something in the region of about 10 to 20 percent by weight of binder, so a very small amount of this stuff are done. What I normally do is put it all in the boat and just put a little bit of binder on it. So if I put a little bit of binder on, there's about a couple of milliliters there, so it's far too much. And then I'm going to mix that together. Now it's quite difficult to mix that together because the binder will um, be sucked into the dry salt that we've just added there. So what we need to do is add a little bit of DI water to help this mixer. So put a little bit of DI water in there, and I've added five milliliters of DI water, and we can give that a go around. give them that time to dry and let you go. Now you can just leave it to dry or you can turn a hair dryer on it to um, speed up that drying process. That's all there is to these things. When you make those inks, it's the same process, really. On the basic level, you need the ink, the conductive additive, a binder, and a carrier. So the binder is uh, the CMC, the conductive additive was the graphite, the metal salt that we used was an oxide, the vanadium pentoxide, and the carrier we used was water. Give them a brown round. The longer you brown them, the better it's going to be because it's all about dispersion. It's all about getting those things thoroughly mixed. I gave that a couple of seconds or so and, and left it because I was quite happy with it. Just keep on doing it. Do it until you're bored of it, do it a little, do it a lot, see what kind of effects that grinding time has. If you've got somewhere mechanically grinding it, so you don't have to do it with your hand, find a way of mechanically doing it. Lots of things to throw in and just making the ink. So there are lots of different carrier bander systems that you can be using, and they're all detailed in the ink making book. Now, I've made previous sheets because uh, it helps me with this. Let's have an agent on top side suite. This one's magnet outside. This one's a carbon. We've got some pre cut zinc. We've got some graphite here pre cut. And if I go to this, we've got a little bit of cell guard that we're going to be using. 
Now, when we make these things initially, we were making supercapacitors. And again, you can see how to do that if you look on supercapacitors 101, or um, if you have a look at the video on supercapacitors, we can go into much more in depth how to make a supercapacitor. What I'm going to do is just make a quick and simple supercapacitor here, which is dual carbon supercapacitor, so the same carbon on both sides. I'm going to cut this out a little bit of cell guard. That can be my separator. Put that on that. And that's my supercapacitor. It's a symmetric supercapacitor because it's two types of carbon that are identical on both sides. I can make asymmetric supercapacitors I want by changing the carbon. And now all I need to do is add a little bit of electrolyte salt. And then you can get two electrolyte salts. You get sodium sulfate and zinc sulfate because they're neutral. They're easy to use. They're neutral. They're relatively safe in terms of chemicals. But you need to be experimenting with other kinds of salts. There are lots of things you can experiment with and lots of salts that you can use. You can even use ordinary table salt. So have a hunt around for other salts that you can use and see what kind of effects those salts have. Now, normally when I do it on an open bench like this, what I do is just put a clamp on it because I'm about to connect it to the power supply and I basically don't want it to move. So if I stick that, it doesn't matter which way around it goes. It doesn't matter which one's negative and which one's positive because it's a symmetric device. So I'll just pop that on. It is in fact now connected to my motor. Swap it around so it's connected to my power supply. I've set my power supply at two volts. A lot of people ask me, <coughs> how do you know what voltage to set your power supply at? Because how do you know what voltage to set it? So all of these things operate at reference cell potentials and you can look those reference cell potentials up to give you what the cell voltage should be. So if you have a look at the cell potential reference to hydrogen, you'll get a list of half cells that you add together to give your overall cell performance. And you can just calculate it from that. Now, quite a good voltage, I normally set this thing all the time, actually, is two. I just add two volts. If I've gotten a bit too much, I turn it down, or I'll look it up and make sure I get it around about right. If it's not off gas, then you can back it up a little bit and see what happens. But then I've got the IF test here, so I can test what's going to happen. And when you're guessing on it, two volts is a good guess. Have a look, see if it bubbles, it's not back it up. If it is, turn it down. Once you get to about 1.23, it's going to start bubbling exactly below the reference potential of most things. The other thing is to look up the reference potential and calculate what it is. So we can sort of left to on our symmetric capacitor, it's connected up to this, if we turn that on, it will immediately begin to pull up charge. So it's now charging quite nicely, and if I turn that off, pop it on here, then we should, says he, we haven't. What have I done? Symmetric capacitor working, turning that motor for a few seconds. So we turn that motor for a few seconds, then a little bit of charge will put on it by symmetric capacitor. Now, symmetric capacitors, remember, are very power dense. That is, they're able to release their energy very, very quickly, but they can't hold much energy. So, what we want to do really is put in a system whereby we can hold more energy. Now, does it cost to pay for this? When we do this, what we do is lower the power density, where we can increase the energy density, and we tend to reduce the life cycle as well. If you think what a supercapacitor is, that would make sense, because a supercapacitor really is just ion separation, no reaction really, and they go back together. When you're using um, metal oxide, you're using redox reaction. Redox reaction always involves side reactions, so there's lots of activity all the time. That has an impact on the life of the device. So a supercapacitor is a metal supercapacitor, you can expect to have a million cycles. When you do an asymmetric supercapacitor, where you're using redox additive onto the actual uh, anode or cathode, then you're going to have another effect, and that effect is going to reduce the life cycle down to something like five or 10,000 cycles. Bear in mind that's hundreds of years, so it doesn't matter that much, plenty to play with, but you do pay a cost for everything that you do. Now, we've actually done this where we had a carbon on the carbon, and we're going to swap one of the carbons to one of the metal oxides, and we're going to use the I'm going to put the vanadium pentoxide on the cathode. We'll get a little bit of vanadium pentoxide ready. We'll pop it onto that. We're going to, going to make it an asymmetric supercapacitor. We've got our vanadium pentoxide, we've got our salt on there, and then we've got our carbon on the top. And if this time we do that, we should see that we get slightly more power out of it. And that makes no surprise if you think about it, because getting slightly more power out of the thing is what you'd expect, is what we're looking for. But we give that a little bit of charge, and we'll find that the relation to you is going to have to be the anti And anti scoping is going to be more than 30 
Alright guys, I think I'm gonna end it here. Uh, I'm probably just gonna buy the batteries at the end of the day. <sighs> just, uh, way too much going on. To make DIY. Alright, peace guys. <laughs>